Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials, video number nine. This is on populations, how they came to be through evolution, how they continue to evolve every day. Um, one of my favorite theories in all of evolution is the idea of the Red Queen theory, and it essentially comes from Alice through the looking glass, or through the looking glass, where Alice, remember, is running around with the Red Queen, and she eventually stops and says, well, in my country, you generally get somewhere if you run as fast as you can, like we've been doing, and the Red Queen says, you live in a slow sort of country. Here, it takes all, you can, all the running you can do just to stay in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast, um, and so What's interesting about that is it's a really good metaphor for how natural selection and evolution takes place. Species are constantly in competition against all of the other organisms around them, and they may not look like they're changing, but they continue to change, and it's shaped the life that we have on our planet. And so uh, what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm going to start with evolution, and the idea is that it's been around from day one. So from day, day one until today, all life on our planet has been created through evolution or change. And also, it continues on a daily basis. Species are evolving every day. Populations are evolving. Because remember, all evolution is is, is a change in the allele frequency of a gene pool. It can lead to speciation, uh, but it's constantly happening every day. What are the mechanisms by which it occurs? Well, we've already talked about a lot of these. Genetic drift, mutations, and we'll talk more about them in the next uh, uh, podcast. But um, today I want to specifically talk about selection. And if you don't have a good understanding of how natural selection occurs, today you're going to get it. Um, and so natural selection is uh, when nature selects which organisms are able to survive or die. And the quintessential example is in the beak of the finch and the work of Darwin, but more importantly, the work of the Grants. Um, sexual selection is a different type of natural or of selection, and that's when mates are selecting based on um, the other gender. Example I'll give you is a peacock. And then the one thing that I forgot to put here is artificial selection, which is another important one. Artificial selection uh, is another type of selection. And uh, that's actually where Darwin starts explaining the mechanisms by which natural selection could occur. One thing that I want to drive home is the idea that all life evolves. So once life shows up on our planet, it's been evolving ever since then. And so archaea live here in the um, in the hot pots of Yellowstone Park, and they look very similar to what the first organisms on our planet probably look like. But the archaea that live here and uh, the, the animals that live in the savanna and the forest, all of these things, all life came from one common ancestor, and they got to be the way they are through a process of evolution. So let's talk specifically about the mechanisms by which that occurs. And when Darwin is explaining uh, in The Origin of the Species, he actually starts with artificial selection because um, it really makes sense to us how that might occur. If we were to look at this great, great Dane and we were to look at this Chihuahua and if we were to look at a wolf, the DNA of all of them is almost identical. And the reason why is that these dog breeds that we have on our planet were created by humans, artificially choosing traits that they want. And you can see the explosion of tiny little breeds of dogs that I'm seeing around right now. It's humans making those choices, selecting which offspring can pass on their traits. In class this year, we'll be using Brassica rapa, which uh, is a, a Wisconsin fast plant. What you can do is you can actually do the selecting. You can choose the traits that you want to pass on to the next generation. And then you can see that artificial selection taking place. And actually, brassica is a type of plant that led to a lot of the different uh, foods that we have today. In fact, a lot of the foods that you eat were created through a process of artificial selection. Um, today, I want to spend a lot of time, however, talking about natural selection, the mechanisms by which that occurs. Um, the most famous studies on Galapagos uh, were done by uh, Peter and Raz Rosemary Grant, and they studied Geospiza fortis. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And they studied those on Daphne Major, which is this rock. I've seen it from a distance. It's just this rock in the Galapagos, but it's a great natural laboratory, so you can study the, the bird populations on it. Now, Natural selection is going to select species to either survive or die, and then the traits are passed on to the next generation. And so here's some data from Peter and Rosemary Grant. In 1976, they sampled all of the birds on Daphne Major that they could find, and they measured their beak depth. In other words, they measured this distance from here to here. So they captured them probably in nets, they measured them with a caliber, and they measured the beak depth all the way across in 1976. And they studied that in 1977, and they studied the beaks for uh, 30 years. They've been studying uh, the beaks of the, the finches on the Galapagos. But what they found is in 1970, 
1977, there's a drought. And so they go back in 1978, and so, let me get the numbers right so you can see them. In 1976, they sampled 751 birds. So there were 751 birds here. But they come back in 1978, and they found there are only 90 birds left. And so lots of times when we draw these graphs, you have a tendency to not realize what the end number, how many species, how many individuals were actually there. And so what happened in that drought of 77, it's like a bird apocalypse. Almost all the birds died from 751 down to 90. Which ones didn't die? The ones that didn't die are ones that had a slightly bigger beak. And so why is that? Well, what the grants found is that they were feeding on seeds that were slightly bigger and harder to break. And so the ones that were able to break those seeds were able to survive, not die, and they were able to pass their genes on to the next generation. And so what happened to our bell-shaped curve? Our bell-shaped curve moved to the right, and so we call that directional selection. Now, are they going to stay this way? No, because if you have a, bird, a big beak, you have to make that beak. You have to fly it around. And so when the, when the weather gets good, what we'll see is we'll actually see, when there's no drought, we're actually going to see it move back in the other's direction or directional change. And so this moving over and over and over. But that's the first type called directional selection. We can also have disruptive selection. Disruptive selection happens when you have the bell-shaped curve of a trait, and then it somehow gets split in the middle. And so an example of that would be the idea that all of the birds on the Galapagos, this is a picture that's actually from Darwin's uh, book, um, all of the finches on the Galapagos started from one ancestral species. In other words, there was one finch that flew there, or, or a population that flew there, maybe two to three million years ago, and the 14 beaks, or the 14 species that we now have on the Galapagos uh, um, islands are actually uh, came through disruptive selection. In other words, if they start feeding on different seeds, you eventually can have two different species and they quit interbreeding and then you can have different varieties. And so even though these look quite a bit different, they all come from one common ancestor. Uh, my favorite are the ones that are actually feeding on the, um, the vampire finch that feeds on, uh, they suck the blood off of the blue-footed boobies on the Galapagos pretty crazy. Last type is stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection occurs when you have, here's our original bell-shaped curve, it happens when you have selection on either side. In other words, you're squeezing that bell shape a little bit closer. I couldn't come up with a great example of the finches on the Galapagos of, of that stabilizing selection. However, it would probably be what shows why one species stays the same. But a great example of this would be in the birth of children. In other words, if you are a tiny baby, let's say back in the day you weighed one pound when you were born, you probably were born premature and you died. If you were like 18 pounds as a baby, you probably didn't get out of your mother and you died and her genes died with you. And so that's going to push that bell-shaped curve together. So that's artificial selection, or excuse me, natural selection. Uh, and then the last type is going to be sexual selection. Sexual selection, it was come up with by Darwin as well, but not really tested until, uh, until the 19th century or the 20th century. Um, in sexual selection, the mate is actually doing the choice. And, and lots of times we'll see sexual dimorphism. In other words, this is a peahen and this is a peacock. And so we see a huge difference in their appearance. And the reason why is that the female is make, making the choice. It's not nature that's making the choice. She's actually making the choice. And so why does a peacock have this beautiful train that it does? It's just going to get in the way. It's doing that to impress the mate. In other words, this female is only going to choose a peacock that has a really big train. Now, why is she doing that? She's looking for herself. She's only going to choose a trait that's going to pass on, uh, or it's a clear indication of the health of that mate. And so if you can make a beautiful train like this, you probably have good DNA. And there were studies done where they would actually eliminate, so they would cut off some of these eyes, and they would find that the female, the peahens, would actually ignore them. They also found in the studies that if the mates, if the males have a really beautiful train like this, they actually produce offspring that are more likely to survive. And so in sexual selection, the female is actually doing the choice, not doing, uh, not nature. And so if we ever see that sexual dimorphism, so like in Montana we have elk, and, and the elk have these huge antlers, but they're doing that to impress their mate. Now Jeffrey Miller has taken this to an extreme, uh, not to an extreme, but he's saying that what is it in humans that is like the peacock's um, feathers? What is it that's like that in us that's just it's, it's grossly in excess. What we would see in humans is that it's our brain. It's how smart we are. 
And why are we so smart? Well, we're trying to impress females. And so it's, it's, it's interesting when you look at males and ask them, what, what are they attracted to in females? A lot of time it's physical characteristics. But when you ask females, it's more behavior. He makes me laugh or he makes me feel good. And so those things are clear indications of brain. And, and Jeffrey Miller will go as far as to say that culture and all of those things are just made through a process of sexual selection. I think he's headed in the right direction.